A century later, the city of Rome, now a thousand years old, became the next great focus of apocalyptic expectation. This is the first time a thousand becomes a significant number. People say, wait a minute, this looks like things that John predicts for the end of time. Rome's millennium celebrations triggered the most vicious persecutions of Christians the empire had ever seen. As the blood of martyrs was shed in amphitheaters, some saw the emperor Decius as the beast of revelation, and this the last fling of evil. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They reigned with Christ a thousand years. For two centuries, the power of Rome and the early church had coexisted uneasily, and the anti-imperial invective in the book of Revelation did nothing to improve matters. But everything changed in the year 313, when the emperor Constantine saw a vision of the cross, defeated his enemies, and declared Christianity a legitimate religion. From the point of view of Constantine's bishops, the awkwardness for Christianity with its own apocalyptic heritage comes with Christianity's political success. The traditional apocalyptic reading has to be wrong because now the empire is Christian. Rome can't be Babylon. The Christian church itself, and especially its leaders, doesn't know quite what to do with the book of Revelation. Most church leaders favored excluding Revelation from the Bible. To this day, it does not appear in the Bible of the Greek Orthodox Church. Then at a council of bishops in the year 394, Augustine, the great Christian scholar and saint, argued that the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John and should be included in the New Testament, if interpreted correctly. Augustine is the dominant Christian leader and thinker of the Western Christian tradition in, uh, in his time. The truly apocalyptic events that were about to engulf the Roman world influenced Augustine's interpretation of Revelation. Augustine himself happened to live, it was his good or bad luck, happened to live in an apocalyptic hot zone. The dr most dramatic event in Augustine's lifetime, of course, is the sack of the city of Rome in the year 410. It was this destruction that moved Augustine to write his great book, The City of God. Rome had been identified with the church, and therefore if Rome fell, that meant that it's the beginning of the period of the Antichrist. What Augustine said is, no, empires rise and empires fall. What is constant is the internal history of the building up of the city of God through the agency of the church. In Augustine's reinterpretation of the book of Revelation, what he essentially does is to say that the symbolism that some people before had been taking literally, none of them were literal. He did not believe in a literal thousand year reign. He did not believe in a literal figure that would come as a, as a kind of antichrist or anything like that. They drew the apocalypticism out of the apocalypse through Augustine's City of God, this spiritualizing interpretation of the Apocalypse became dominant in the West for a thousand years. He sort of, uh, you know, puts it on tranquilizers in a way. And this becomes the position of the Church historically, in fact, pretty much down to the present. As the classical world gave way to the Dark Ages, the church continued to see the imagery of John's revelation in purely symbolic terms. At the level of the elite, which is what historians can see because they're the only ones leaving texts, millennialism is gone. At the level of popular Christianity, it's still thriving. 
So if you look at the emerging Christian art of this period, the popular mind of Christianity uh, in the early Middle Ages is much more literalistic in its reading of the book of Revelation. By now, the year 1000, the first Christian millennium was drawing near. Whereas Eastern religions see time as a cycle of birth and rebirth, apocalyptic thinking assumes time has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The linear view of time and history so central to the book of Revelation was to shape the intellect and imagination of the West. As ordinary people became increasingly aware of time passing, the approaching millennium took on a new significance. Bede, who was a monk in northern England at the time, comes up with chronological changes, including the introduction of Anno Domini, and a whole new set of calculations for the age of the world. So the new Christian calendar starts at the year zero and counts forward. It's going to raise the specter of what happens when we get to the year 1000. They're stuck with this date, and that's the date at which the commoner, popular enthusiasm about millennialism surges up to the top. We get pilgrimages, we get popular heresy, apostolic movements. The year 1000 is approaching, that magic number that will always cause people to think about the book of Revelation. On the eve of the first Christian millennium, a new pope was enthroned. Pope Sylvester II became the pope in the year 999. The last mass of 999 was going to be the occasion perhaps this time, for Christ not only to emerge in the Eucharist to be seen by the faithful, but to emerge on earth from heaven at his second coming. It must have been a really anxious time for those people. But of course, the hour passed and nothing happened. And the congregation breaks out Te Deum Laudemus, praise be unto God, the world had not ended. But it still leaves a lingering question that Christianity will have to wrestle with, when will it happen? millennium had come and gone. A thousand years of Christian history had passed. But Jerusalem, that sacred symbol in the apocalyptic imagination, was now firmly in Islamic hands, the site of the temple dominated by Muslim shrines. In 1095, Pope Urban II issued a call to take it back from the infidels. It would initiate 300 years of holy war, the Crusades. The Crusades probably began as an attempt to liberate the Eastern Mediterranean for Christians to live there. But as the Crusades themselves began to grow in popular imagination, and as the Holy War rhetoric became more prominent, it starts to take on these much more apocalyptic tones. Each victory and then defeat only added to the sense that this was a battle of cosmic proportions, uh, that this was really about the Antichrist. 